Hello everyone, welcome to the Renner Bros YouTube channel. This is my brother Paul. Paul has installed thousands of doors and he knows everything there is to know about them. Today what we're going to do is we're going to teach you how to install an entry door. We're going to kind of uh, show you the process and maybe point out some things to avoid. Make sure you know how to do it correctly so that you get a door that operates um, really well for years. So this is our new door. This is a fiberglass door with vinyl jams and vinyl brick mold. And so it's gonna to be totally weatherproof. So one of the things that'll make your job more efficient is to have all the proper tools starting out. So some of the tools you wanna have on hand are an impact driver for driving screws, a drill for pre-drilling, a reciprocating saw for actually cutting the fasteners or shims on your door, potentially cutting the jam. Preferably a hammer, a pry bar. If you're cladding your door, you'll want to have a bevel square. You also want to have levels. I have here with me both a two foot level for making sure that your sill is sitting level, and then also a six foot level for making sure that your jam is plumb in the opening. Cool. Okay, so before we get started installing the door, I'm going to teach you how to do a measure up. You'll need a tape measure for this. Step one, you want to measure your height of your siding opening and your width of your siding opening. So you want to measure from the very bottom of where your sill is going to hit on your new door to the very top of where your siding opening is. In this case, it happens to be brick with a, a metal lentil underneath. We have about 82 inches. Next, you're going to want to measure the siding opening width-wise from brick to brick in this case and we have about 40 and a quarter inches. Typically I would measure several different locations just in case the brick wasn't done plumb, uh, which is very common. Plumb is with a level here. You wanna make sure, if possible, in this case, the brick was done pretty decently actually. You'll wanna make sure that you, you know, obviously have the measurements for the siding opening, write them down. Next you wanna go inside. You wanna get a measurement on your jam depth. So your jam depth is from your exterior of your jam to the interior of your jam right before it meets the trim. So you don't want to measure your brick mold or your interior casing. This looks like they've done a little bit of a pad out, so we won't need to use that. After that, you'll want to measure on the inside, most likely your frame size. Okay, so next you'll want to measure from the floor to the inside of your jam which we have about 80 and 3 quarters, then typically you'll want to add an inch and a half for your jam size. That way you know what type of frame size your opening or your rough opening can accommodate. Obviously you also want to measure the width of the door itself. So this is a 36 inch wide jam opening and then you'll add an inch and a half to that because typically jam thickness is three quarter inches from the inside where the door sits. Your jam size will be 37 and a half by 81 and a half inches tall. This is a 36 by 80 inch slab and that's perfect for our application. We have a 36 by 80 inch door so that should slide right in. You will also want to keep in mind the, the swing and operation of the door. You want to know which way it swings open. This would be considered a left hand end swing you always want to face the way that the door is operating. So this is a left-handed inswing. This would be a left-handed outswing. So if the door is operating that way, this is a right-handed outswing. Um, when you're installing a door, particularly an inswing door, you always want to make sure that the direction your door swings is always to the very, you know, furthest in part of the wall that it can be. That way your extension jam doesn't prevent the door from opening fully. If you have your door set to the outside and you have to put your extension jam on the in, your door will only be able to open up until it binds up with that extension jam. The next thing you should consider is any little decorations or small pieces such as a doorbell or trim that need to be removed prior to taking the door out. Um, you'll want to score the paint lines on the inside up along your trim 
as well as any caulk lines on the exterior trim. Now we're just going to start removing these doors. You'll have this old caulk bead potentially that's still adhered to the brick. You want to take either a putty knife or a chisel you don't care a whole lot about and scrape the old caulk off. So typically with a job like this, you'll want to leave the slab on until all your trim is removed just to prevent airflow from blowing dust throughout the house. But in this particular instance, the customer's not home. Uh, we want to cut the trim off. What we'll do is we'll score the paint line, make sure to not pull the paint with the trim, and then we'll take our pry bar hammer right between this groove here and pull the trim loose. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to cut the jam and actually remove the jam from the rough opening. So on the doorbell side of the jam, you want to be careful not to overcut with your sawzall just so as not to damage the doorbell wire. pile of dust right there. Mm -hmm. Next we're going to clean the area of debris uh, to allow for our door to have a nice clean set on the sill so we can get a good level and we can also have our caulk adhere to something besides dust and dirt. <laughs> One thing that's beneficial to have in case you'd like to reuse your old doorbell or potentially just update to a, a still wired doorbell is a pack of doorbell wire. Um, if you do happen to overcut your jam when removing it, uh, it's very handy, especially if you're on the job for another customer to have on hand. What we're going to do on this particular project is we're actually going to move the doorbell to the opposite side of the door because they had it on the hinge side and we prefer to have it on the handle side where it's typically normal to put a doorbell. One of the things you want to pay attention to when you're installing your new door, and one thing that will make it a lot easier to install your new door, is making sure that the inside wall board is flush with the rough opening or rough framing of your home. Uh, this, they don't have completely flush, but since they did like a concrete and plaster, we're not gonna actually remove it. And we do have quite a lot of space here. I think we have 38 and three quarter inches. So that's well beyond what we actually need for our door frame to go in. Uh, but typically it makes it easier to put shims in and then later spray foam insulate around your door. So we're gonna clean our sill off dry fit our door, pull it back out after we know it's been fit smoothly, lay a bead of sealant on the sill, set our door in the hole, and then adjust it from there. So we will have to modify the opening a little bit um, just because our door is not able to go back flush to the inside wall board. So one of the issues you might have run into when you're installing a door is an undersized drywall opening or interior wall covering opening. And that's what we have here at the head. Our new unit is a little bit taller than the existing. And so we're bumping up against the interior wall, which happens to be chicken wire and plaster. So what we're gonna do is actually cut that back a little bit so that our door jam will fall in freely and that way we can flush it out to the inside wall surface. Okay, after we've determined that our door will indeed fit in our opening, we're gonna tape a tube of uh, exterior grade sealant for our seal along our sill. We're gonna punch open the tube, 
pivot it a little bit so you get a full sized opening that you're not binding up the tube when you go to squeeze on it. And we're gonna put some sealant on the sill. So the way we have this sealant laid out is where the door is solid on the sill. A lot of doors have support braces or arches underneath of them just for the ease of manufacture. But you want to make sure you get a good seal from your sill to your threshold of your door. So we've laid the caulk out where the sill will be contacting the threshold. So we're going to set the door actually into our sealant. Now one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to get the inside surface of our door jam to be flush essentially to our wall surface. So to do that, we don't have anything currently to brace with and because this is plaster over top of block, there's no real great way to put a screw and a shim to hold it up against the wall. So one of the specialty tools that I like to have, it's only like $10, $15, is actually an air shim and that allows you to pump the door slab which allows the jam to tilt in and out. You have a little release here that you can you know, lower the door or pump it up to fold the door so that you can maintain that flush surface. Peel back our weather strip and we're actually going to mark where the board is on the actual wall. So here is where our block is behind the jam. We're going to make a little notation there so it won't be hidden or we can wipe it off easy after we've pre-drilled. You want to at least have three if not five screws on this side. We're going to pre-drill here with a 3 16th inch drill bit. Uh, that will allow your shank of your screw to pass through the jam while still anchoring into the, the wall. And what that does is it allows the jam to be pulled tight or loosened without the screw binding on the actual jam. You typically would put your fasteners through the, the hinges on the screw holes that are closest to the inside of the door jam rather than towards the wall. That way they have some significant bite to them. But because the way that this framing is laid out on this home, it's mostly block with a couple of wood block inserts. There's no way for us to actually use these holes in the hinge plate. So the next thing we're gonna have to do is get shims and we're gonna have to get quite a lot of them because it's a pretty big gap. So what I'd like to do is uh, cut a piece of half inch plywood down, use that as some thicker shim blocks to kind of save on all those little shim pieces you're gonna have to cut off later. So the next thing we wanna do is actually make sure our door is in the opening left and right evenly. That way our trim on the outside doesn't look odd. The inside isn't as critical typically because you can cut back your baseboard or you know move things a little bit left and right. But because this is brick, there's no room to move any kind of like a J channel. Uh, so what we're gonna do is make sure our distance from our brick to our sill plate is the same on each side. So right there we've got about two and an eighth, and over here we've got about two and a sixteenth, so we're pretty close. We might fidget it a little bit to this side, just to eat up some of that space. Yep, two and a sixteenth, two and a sixteenth, there we go. What we're also going to do, now that we've got the door set in place, is take our little two foot level, set it all the way towards the back of the sill, slide it left, slide it right and check and make sure that bubble is dead center in our level which it is fortunately since this is an exterior door you want to use exterior grade screws so this is an exterior grade screw that has ridges along the head that actually cut into the jam as you bore it further in we want to get our door sitting totally plumb so to do that we're going to use our six foot level this one's a little bit longer than six foot specifically for doors um, and we're going to try to make sure that that's totally plumb. Obviously, running between the two lines, dead center. Uh, like drawn towards the frame a bit. You want to take care not to damage your weather stripping, and if you need to, you can also remove the weather stripping totally from the door. Okay, so now one of the things we're going to do now that we've got it set, shimmed in place, we're going to adjust the door as needed uh, to make sure that our door is sealing 
properly. Uh, so now that we've set it here, I'm going to tap our jams in and out to make sure that it's lining up with our inside wall board. We can adjust our shim tightness as needed because it is going to loosen up. We don't have all our fasteners in. You can do this with the palm of your hand or you know, a little hammer to give it a little bit of a love tap. And after having done that, you're going to hold onto your door, release your shim, and then test the fit of your door. And then it sounds like it's hitting the sill pretty decently, but you'll want to also take a look underneath, make sure there's no light gaps. It is an adjustable threshold, so you can obviously take care of that after the fact. We already know that it's level, but when you're looking to make sure the door hits the weather strip perfectly, you want to take a look at the plane of the door at the top and at the bottom and make sure that the gap between the inside of the jam and the door face is the same at the top and the bottom. We're going to adjust, adjust the door either by kicking the sill out or by moving the head portion in to make sure there's distances between the surface of your door and the inside edge of the jam are even. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're actually going to use this great stuff, window and door foam, and spray foam insulate our door jam. That way there's less weather infiltration. You do want to check for light gaps. If you go inside and close your door after you've spray foamed, you can see like up here there's a small gap where the foam is sagged. If you can see up there, you want to touch that area up. So one thing we like to do when we're actually sealing our door is sometimes there's a little bit of slope on your sill. And what we like to do is take our spray foam nozzle, get it underneath there, and actually insulate along the way just to firm up the sill and add an extra little layer of insulation underneath it. So the next thing is we're going to be cutting our shims flush to the actual jam or maybe a little bit back in just to give ourselves room to put our trim on. You want to make sure that your foam is mostly to fully cured for this. It usually takes about 10 minutes to 30 minutes to cure. Um, you can use a utility knife, but I found this is more expedient just to use your oscillating saw. So after you're done cutting your shims off, you just want to make sure you mark your reveals, particularly on these type of PVC jams. They typically don't have, uh, especially if you get your brick mold knocked down, they don't have any paint lines or anything to distinguish the half inch line. And even if they're joined at the top corners where they have this mortise set in, you want to make sure that you're marking a true half inch because this is going to be 35 inches on the inside. So you want to make sure you step it back out to 36 in case you would want to put a storm door on in the future. So we're going to want to do our top piece first. And to get the measurement for that, we go from our lentil down to our half inch reveal mark. Uh, so we'll measure that. That happens to be one inch tight there. And about seven eighths on that side. So we'll do it seven eighths across the whole thing. For this particular application, it's a short run and we can seal with caulk at the top. If it were something more more different, where it would be like an inch and a quarter down to like half inch, we would want to rip a custom strip at that point. But for our purposes today, we'll just do seven eighths of an inch. For your table saw, you'll want to set your fence at the desired measurement to the inside edge of the blade. We got it at 7 8 And then we're going to make sure that we run the inside, which is going to be the side we're keeping, up along the fence. That way, the measurement of what we're keeping is touching the fence and everything else is the off fall. So we'll start our table saw. It's going to be And now that we look like the abominable snowman, we can put our piece onto our door. I've got a 16 gauge DeWalt finish nailer. And we're gonna use that to nail our trim on. Okay, we're gonna set our trim to our reveal mark. And then we are going to check, make sure it's running pretty straight, which it is. And then we're gonna Take our nailer, pop a nail in that end, 
run it out to here, pop the nail into that end. And then we'll go back through, make sure we're keeping a half inch, and pop two more nails in. So since we didn't have as many fasteners, the door is prone to flex. Therefore, we're gonna have to double check, make sure everything is still within tolerances throughout the time of the job. Okay. okay, so that's how your miter should fit. Uh, should be pretty tight at the top, but still flush with your lentil. Um, should be able to mostly stand alone. You don't want to have too much play. You want it to be tight, but not too short. So you try to get it fit as evenly as possible. Okay, so first you're going to want to put a nail in the top where your miter is, because that's the most critical point of your trim on the outside. You want to make sure that's good and tight. And if you need to, you can put a putty knife in the back here or a utility knife or even a shim to hold tension towards your miter. That way when you nail it tight, it doesn't separate. Next, you're going to want to actually shoot a nail in the bottom because you want to make sure that your two ends are at your 36 inch mark. Next, you're going to want to get your level and set it on the inside face of your brick mold. Hold it with your foot and your hand, making sure it's running plumb and true and straight. And then put nails in the middle and along the inside face. About every 12 to 16 inches. On this side, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually bore for our doorbell wire to fit through. That way we can mount the doorbell with no issue. So we're gonna measure about 40 inches up from our floor or from our sill and mark for our doorbell. Now our doorbell, we probably wanna have either surface mount or out to the edge if we're gonna maybe do a storm door. Uh, it's up to you. In this particular instance, we're not doing a storm door. We're just doing the entry. So we'll mark ours toward the inside. So the surface mounted doorbell sits flush. So what we're going to do, this is not the typical wing bit you would use, but we're going to use this as a pre-drill for our wires to go through. So you want to make sure you mark the center of it, have a hold of it, and then angle slightly towards the outside so that when your wire passes through, it's able to cleanly get through that hole. Make sure it's running plumb, make sure it's running flat, and then put nails every 16 to 12 inches. Now typically you would nail the outside edge of the, of the brick mold on the exterior just so it would adhere to the actual sheathing on the house, but because this is a brick and block opening, there's not actually anything to nail into in that area. All right, so now we can mount our doorbell. Okay, so this is a surface mount doorbell. Uh, the one we're going with is brushed nickel. We're trying to keep everything similar as far as the styling of everything. That's always a good thing to do too. Uh, customers don't often know what they want, but you should at least have an idea of some sense of style, whether it be black sill, black hinges, black oil rub bronze doorknob. We try to keep things simple with stainless or brushed nickel. Okay, so this has a couple of set screws in the back. What you're gonna do is you're gonna cut these wires or at least push them back so you have a little bit more in the, the opening. You're gonna separate these wires, cut them to a, a length that's manageable, strip the ends off of them and make a slight U-bend in them, loosen your set screws, and then tighten the set screws once you've hooked the U-bend of your wire down on top of each each one correspondingly. Hook it on here. You're going to want to make sure that you put the hook so that, that when you tighten the screw, it's going to continually tighten your hook.
Don't, just remember not to over tighten. This is a very small fine thread machine screw. It's not an exterior grade fastener. It's not going to hold up to a lot of pressure. So once you get that done, you want to make sure you push the excess of your wires back inside. Line it up so it's parallel with the inside edge of your brick mold. And you want to get a little 16th of an inch drill bit and pre-drill each of these prior to setting the screw. Parallel with your surface. Pre-drill. Pre-drill. So one of the products we like to feature on the channel is actually Quickset. They have a product called the Smart Key. And that, what that means is these locks are enabled with the ability to key on site or re-key on site. And so we like to use them in a lot of our rentals. And uh, that's what we'll be using today. So one aspect of installing the door is applying your handle set and your deadbolt. That way you can actually lock the door. Uh, when you're doing so, you want to be aware of the different setbacks for your doors. So in this particular door, it's a two and three quarter inch setback. And what the setback means is it's a setback from the edge of your door slab to where the center of the bore for the hole is. So this is a two and three quarter inch setback. That means you'll have to twist and adjust your deadbolt and your latch plate mechanism so that they are at the two and three quarter setback mark. This is for two and three eighths. This is for two and three quarters. Like I said, typically we pre-drill these areas, but because it's PVC, it's relatively soft. And quick set smart keys often have this feature. It's nice, it's a little slip feature. So what you do is you would extend your inner handle the whole way out, and then you just twist the outside collar, and that twists the screws out of this little eyelet catch. And then you can take this piece, fish it through, your little latch area, hopefully better than I'm doing. Take this piece and where the eyelets are, slip it onto your handle. I can do it in the proper direction, there we go. And twist it back on, line up your holes, press fit it. Then take your screwdriver and tighten it. That way you don't have to totally wind your screws the whole way back out to get them back in again. It saves a decent bit of time and I'm really glad Quickset made this feature. You wanna make sure you tighten them both evenly. They sometimes do tighten unevenly. So you'll place this through. And then next you'll line the inside up Carefully, we'll have to rotate the outside shell so that the lock word says up. You'll want to pivot your lock outward. All of this while holding onto the outside portion of your deadbolt. Then fish your bolts through. Make sure they're lined up with the holes in your mechanism. Some of it I know is for cheapness and to be able to change the outside color quickly, but it does tend to make these things relatively difficult to hang on to. Make sure you're finishing off tightening with a hand screwdriver rather than an impact driver just so you don't damage your door. So the next thing we're gonna do is make sure our latch plate is allowing the door to close properly. So we're gonna close the door and see how much play there is there for the latch to hit the original hole. Um, after that, we determined that our latch plate can go in without any additional mortising of that pocket. Uh, so we're gonna pre-drill this particular area and put the fasteners in place. Oftentimes it's better to put one screw in just to test the set on it. So that's what we'll do. We'll see if it cinches tight into the, the area without mortising first. But. If it doesn't, we can always run our utility blade along the area to be mortised. It's not very much. We 
So this particular bit, we're having to re-mortise this side of the jam for a latch plate that Quickset seems to continually send us. Set it up here so that we know we're going to clear. We've already measured our latch plate. We know the depth is proper. It's going to hit our weather stripping and it's going to seal tight. So what we do then is we measure where our deadbolt is going to hit. We put our latch plate there. We know it's going to clear. And then we trace around it with our pencil to form the silhouette of where we need to mortise out. It's good to get this line as close as you can to where your actual mortise is going to be and to keep it parallel with the face of your jam. But essentially what we're going to do is make a half, half inch jig so that we can run our router on the jam. Probably going to leave about a oh, quarter inch or so and do that. Okay, so the, now that we've made our little jig here that we've screwed into our latch plate, we set it so that we have the ability to see our entire profile of our latch. This surface is flush, and uh, what we're going to do now is set our router depth to allow us to drill or to, to mortise our latch plate out to the full depth that we want it to be in the areas we want it to be. This does get very messy. So do be mindful of that. Locked our more router to that. I turn it on. After we've taken our jig off, we've dusted everything up, we've cleaned it up. We are going to actually set the plate. We reattached our latch plate for this. This guy's gonna go in here. Make sure where he's where you want him to be but actually close your door, make sure he's gonna latch properly. Now your drill will need to have a hammer function on it for this. Uh, mine fortunately does, but you'll wanna use a rotary hammer bit uh, that goes in your regular drill, or if you have an SDS, that could work too. Now you want to make sure not to over tighten these because you can break the block out or you can strip the screw or break the head off the screw. So the next thing you want to remember to do is put your sealing wedges in place. Uh, they're adhesive backed foam strip. What you want to do is when you're done and it feels like or sounds like it's hitting the whole way across, you'll want to put your eye down low and check and make sure there's no light coming from the inside. Do the reverse on the inside. Check, make sure there's no light coming from the outside. We'll tear off our second ceiling wedge. And we place that behind the ceiling strip at the base of the door. You'll want to do a quarter inch reveal on your interior trim uh, or as close to it as you can get. So you'll measure up from the inside of your jam a quarter inch. Just want to make a little right angle mark here in the corner with a quarter inch reveal each way. The bottom you can make a quarter inch reveal or you can eyeball it as needed. It looks like we will have to cut back our baseboard as we'll need a three and a quarter inch trim. So our cut back from the inside of the jam ought to be three and a half. What we'll do, we'll measure from our jam, three and a half inches. We'll make a mark on each side. Then we'll get our little torpedo level. We'll strike a line that's plumb with our torpedo level. And we'll cut that baseboard to the shape it needs to be. So when you mark for your baseboard, you want to have your little torpedo level. You want to mark off the line that you drew for your proper setback for your trim. Then you want to make sure your torpedo level is plumb while still holding on that line that you created. Then strike a line on the face of the baseboard. 
Then you can take your multi-tool or oscillating saw and cut along that line. But you basically want to get a level. So you want to make sure you're all the way to the floor. Cut your, or mark your corner where your miter is going to be and set that aside. You want to do the same thing to the other side. Where you set it down on the floor, set it up along your piece, and transfer that mark from your miter joint onto the piece of trim. So next you're going to want to put inch and a quarter nails into your trim nailer. Load those. Get your trim lined up on your space to be nailed. And for this particular application, we're only going to be nailing the inside edge. We may glue the back side just because this is plaster over block. And that side shot fast. You're probably going to want to seal the back side with a quad or some kind of really tacky adhesive. You'll want to tape the wall prior to that just to make sure not to get any slip over where your caulk goes onto your painted surface. But because this is a block with plaster on it, there's not a real great way for us to fasten this trim other than pre-gluing the back side of it. Do a little bit of mortising or rabbiting. If you can see, I had to rabbit the back side of this trim out. I just took it on the sliding miter saw cut about an eighth inch to about a quarter inch deep and then use a chisel to tap off the excess. So it'll go over top of that little bump out that we have where the concrete protrudes. When you do trim nailing, you wanna make sure that you're not over nailing or potentially nailing it at too much of an angle where you would potentially blow out or curly cue a nail either into your door slab or out through the face of your trim. It does happen even to the best, best carpenters, but to try to minimize the amount, you want to make sure you straight nail as close as you can get to parallel with your jam. So now that we're done trimming the sides, we're going to have to trim the head. Now the way to do that is take your tape measure, butt it up against your trim on the inside edge, on the left side or the right, and measure it to the inside. If you need to, it's best to leave a sixteenth long. So we've got 36 and a half, a little bit heavy. When we measure our, our trim, we're going to measure from short side to short side, which is the inside. You'll want to probably hold your measurement on the one inch mark, add an inch, and go out to 37 and a half instead of 36 and a half. That way you get an accurate read from a line to a line rather than this little slip nose that has a tendency to move. We cut it so we're just a whisper long. It looks like 45 is going to be a good angle for us which is nice because that's quite honestly pretty rare. Sometimes you have to make it 44 and a half, 46. Everything changes if your wall's a little bowy or your eye's a little bit out with marking your reveal. So what we're gonna do, hold it up there with our miters tight. We're gonna make a line and cut off that little bit of excess. Try to get our miters as tight as possible. A lot of times, once you're done this stage, you'll need a caulk in the joint if it's a little bit too big. Sometimes you'll have to flex the middle down a little bit. This being three and a quarter inch trim, it's a little bit large, and sometimes you'll have to actually flex it if possible, or even trim it at odd angles, like a 44 and a half degree, to get it to meet up properly. And last but not least, you can shoot nails into the corner. However, I would recommend probably gluing uh, and putting potentially a shim behind. Shims do tend to help keep your miters meeting up tight. And then also you can flex it apart, put a dab of caulk in there, put a shim behind, squeeze out the excess, slick it, wipe the corners out so you keep your profile. And then when you're done, slick up along the paint line in the back of the trim and you're good to go. All right, so for this particular part of the job, you're going to want a caulk gun. You're going to want a caulk tube. We use a Quad Max, which is a great exterior product. And then you're going to want a paper towel. What we're doing is we're sealing the joint between the trim, or the exterior casing, and your brick. 
We're also going to seal the joint between your brick mold and your jam just to make sure there's no water penetration. All right, so that is how you install an entry door. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. As always, subscribe down below, comment, and like this video to see more.